memory, recovery, critical approaches to heritage, monuments, and memory in the academy. This panel challenges the academic community to take action in subverting and countering exclusionary histories, focusing on how we can leverage our positions, our research, and our community to begin to rectify centuries of silencing, erasing and excluding Black voices and histories through archaeology, history, and heritage studies. This series, Monuments, Markers, and Memory, is a collaborative effort um, and is supported by the Florida Public Archaeology Network, the University of South Florida Department of Anthropology, the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum, the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art, and the New College Public Archaeology Lab. The symposium series received generous support from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities and from USF Research and Innovation. First, um, I would like to acknowledge that the land, and I am currently at New College, where, who is hosting this event in Sarasota. I would like to acknowledge that the land we are on today are the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole, as well as other historical groups, including the Calusa and Tocobaga. Today, the state of Florida is home to the Seminole, Miccosukee, Muscogee, and Choctaw, and to individuals of other native groups. We recognize the historical and continuing impacts of colonization on indigenous, indigenous communities, their resilience in the face of colonial and state-sponsored violence, and fully support indigenous sovereignty. Second, I would like to acknowledge the state of Florida's difficult history with slavery and anti-Black racism since the arrival of the first enslaved Africans with the Spanish near St. Augustine in the 16th century. Florida was a slaveholding state. On the eve of the Civil War, enslaved African Americans accounted for 44% of Florida's population. Florida seceded from the Union in 1861, confirming the state's commitment to maintaining the horrific institution of slavery. Even after the end of the Civil War, Reconstruction and Jim Crow in Florida were defined by anti-Black racism and violence. So I want, I want to just kind of um, also remind people as we begin here to register for the keynote from artist activist writer uh, John Sims this Saturday at 7 p.m. entitled Redress, the Plantation as Marker Memorial Monument. I'll post the link in the chat to registration. Lastly, um, please feel free to add questions or comment to the chat um, with your chat um, button as we will have an audience Q&A at the end of the panel. So now I would like to introduce our moderator. I'll stop sharing my screen here. Um, our moderator for today's panel. If I can get my little bio, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Emerald Morrow, reporter for Bright Size at 10 News Tampa Bay. Ms. Morrow's work has um, and earned multiple awards, including an Emmy for Best Continuing Coverage. She's also been recognized by the Associated Press, Press in both Michigan and Florida, Florida's chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Michigan Association of Broadcasters. Thank you for moderating this discussion, Emerald, and thank everyone in attendance tonight. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here, and I am so excited to be moderating this panel on what is Black History Month? And as we seek to really think about the contributions of African-Americans, it's also important to think about the ways in which African-American voices have not been included and how they've been erased. And we're gonna to touch a lot on that this evening. So again, I wanna welcome everyone. We have a very, very exciting panel, a very distinguished panel. We have several people who will be speaking with us tonight and we are going to start with Dr. Jennifer Scott. And I'm gonna read a quick bio and we're gonna go over all of the lovely accomplishments we have here from Dr. Scott. She is an anthropologist, curator, and public historian whose work explores connections between museums, art, place, and social justice. She recently served as director and chief curator of Jane Addams Whole House Museum, which is a historic landmark in Chicago where I spent many years at Northwestern University. <laughs> um, and that focuses on civil rights and human rights issues. 
And at Hull House, she has led many exhibitions, community engagement efforts, and overall the vision of the museum for nearly six years. So quite an accomplishment there. In 2019, the museum was recognized with the Award for Excellence in Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice by the Association of Midwest Museums. Previously, Jennifer served as Vice Director and Director of Research at Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, which is a nationally significant historic site that memorializes a free Black independent community in 19th century New York. That is amazing. Jennifer is currently the Vice President for the Association of Midwest Museums. I served at, as faculty at the New York School in at the New School in New York, where she teaches courses in arts and civic engagement, cultural anthropology, race and ethnic studies, and museum and global studies. Jennifer researches, writes, lectures locally and internationally on arts, social change, memory and place, contested histories, and innovative strategies for museums, history sites, arts, and cultural centers. We welcome you, Dr. Scott, and we are very anxiously awaiting your presentation. Thank you so much for that introduction, Emerald. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I wanna give a special thank you to the brilliant artist, John Sims, who, whose work has uh, inspired this summit, uh, and Diane Wallman, and to all of your teams for inviting me to speak and in conversation with these incredible panelists. Um, and I believe that, there we go. Thank you, Diana, is getting my slides up. Uh, so with this, we're talking a little bit about the Academy and I just wanna say outright, I always have a foot in and outside of the Academy. I, as Emerald mentioned, I teach at the New School in New York. I teach cultural anthropology and museum studies and global studies. Um, but I also work a lot with uh, museums and historic sites and art centers. Um, and the, the intersection is what I think brings a lot of us here together on the panel. Um, my focus on um, marginalized or what people call erased histories uh, at these sites and trying to restore those histories or to excavate and, and provide counter narratives to existing narratives. Um, so I'm really thankful to be able to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing uh, with the Monuments Commission uh, in Chicago today. Um, and we can move to the first slide. So I wanted to give you an example just off the, the at the beginning uh, of the kinds of conversations that people were already having in Chicago, outside of the South, outside of Confederate monuments um, in, in maybe Northern cities, specifically in Chicago, in confronting monuments. And uh, this is uh, picturing uh, Michelle Duster, who's the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells, who's, as many of you know, a well-known suffrage activist and uh, journalist, a leader in anti the anti-lynching campaign, and uh, has a strong connection to Chicago, yet there had never been any sort of substantial tribute to her. And for over a decade, uh, her family and other advocates had been trying to raise enough money to do that. Um, next slide, please. And then last year, finally, there was a huge breakthrough. The Congress Parkway, if you're familiar with Chicago, it's a major boulevard here in Chicago, was renamed for Ida B. Wells. Um, and they, the, the advocates and, the, and Michelle Duster finally raised enough money to be able to create a new monument. So they're now working with black artist Richard Hunt, who many of you may know, to create this new monument. It'll be interesting to see uh, what comes out of that. Next slide. So another example, um, Jean-Baptiste Plan de Saab is attributed with being the first non-native settler of Chicago. He's of Haitian descent. And many groups in Chicago have been advocating for a long time to create a monument that will do justice to his legacy beyond this small bust that you see here. He has not been memorialized in on quite the same level as white settlers of Chicago or white so-called pioneers. At the same time, we know that he didn't come 
to a place that wasn't already inhabited by indigenous communities. So it also raises the question with a new monument, how we tell our shared stories of, um, of, of indigenous communities, but also non-native past as well. Next slide, please. There's many more conversations, uh, but a lot of these confrontations uh, culminated this summer in, in protests and activism and clashes around three Columbus statues in Chicago that were all removed because people, uh, police and protesters were injured. Next, next slide, please. In response, the city formed a new memorials and monuments initiative it's now called the Chicago Monuments Project. And it was intended to specifically address the nationwide conversation that's happening. I would say global conversation that's reckoning with, uh, oh, we can stay on the uh, slide before. <laughs> Thank you. That's reckoning with antagonistic, singular, false, incomplete historical narratives that are represented through monuments and other public works and to specifically talk about some of these hard truths of uh, the past that have been very racialized. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our charge is to create an advisory committee, which has been done. We've been meeting fairly regularly since the summer. It's 30 people strong, very, very diverse, artists, cultural and civic leaders, elected officials, historians, preservationist, and we're talking about the academy, there's quite a few academics on the committee uh, who are really invested and focused on the educational and historic elements uh, around monuments. Um, another part of our task is to assess the public art collections of sister agencies like the Chicago uh, Parks District and the Chicago Public Schools and to flag problematic monuments that need to be reviewed and recommendations made. Another important part of this process is to create a, a, a public engagement platform so that we can have as many conversations as possible to learn from one another how people think about these monuments that are flagged, but also how people think about memorializing in general. Um, and then finally, uh, making recommendations on the monuments that are under review, but also working with contemporary artists to create new work and new memorials and new ways of memorializing. Next slide, please. So uh, there are 500 works right now that are being reviewed and they're being flagged for these criteria connected to uh, narratives of white supremacy, um, inaccurate or demeaning characterizations of uh, American Indians or indigenous communities connected to historical racist acts like slavery and genocide, um, presenting one-sided stories, oversimplified. Um, and of course, there's huge gaps in these stories. So uh, women uh, are left out a lot in the monuments landscape, as I'm sure many people know, people of color, and, and also certain themes like labor, migration, and uh, community building. Next slide, please. So we haven't quite gotten to the point of uh, commissioning <laughs> new monuments yet, but I just wanted to include some examples of what's possible. And to, to point out that there's a huge range of options between leaving a monument up as is and removal. There's relocation, there's recontextualization that can happen in all sorts of ways and permanent interventions and temporary interventions and modifications. There's alternative monuments that can happen. Uh, there are brand new monuments. So adding monuments to the monuments landscape. So there's lots more options than people think. Um, I wanted to suggest the National Memorial for Peace and Justice led by the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, which is both a monument and a museum. Um, and this is in the ca category of creating entirely new monuments of huge parts, parts of history that have been uh, ignored or erased or injustices that have not been talked about that people don't want to talk about. In this case, this is a monument to the more than 4,000 racial terror lynchings, um, often by hanging, that happened between 1877 and 1950. So there's these huge 800 steel blocks, each of them six feet tall, uh, that are... Uh, 
that mark the 80, the 800 counties where lynchings happened. And so in some ways you could argue that this is very traditional medium, you know, in terms of scale, it's very monumental. But on the other hand, it's very non-traditional because of the subject matter and, and the conversation that it's taking on. Next slide, please. There's also, um, we're gonna be working with contemporary artists and there's so many possibilities as we've seen from John Sims work and others in um, what's possible in creating interventions of problematic monuments. And I suggest that we look at the activists who are already <laughs> making interventions. This is taken down NOLA, um, uh, drawing attention to a Supreme Court justice who also was involved in the KKK. They hooded him. They raised the question in the signage, is this what a terrorist looks like? Um, so I think there's lots of creative possibilities to think about what interventions might look like in the future with artists. Uh, next slide, please. This is a, a historic house museum that I worked at for 10 years in Brooklyn, Weeksville Heritage Center, um, which marks a free black community in pre-Civil War, uh, New York, 1838, uh, that was thriving, uh, very anti-slavery, but was completely erased from the books. I bring it up because I think about all the historic house museums and, and as their own kind of monument and to, suggest that we broaden our, our idea of what constitutes a monument. So since I know plantations have been part of this summit, I think it's important to think about even vernacular architecture and homes uh, as their own kind of monument to people. Uh, next slide, please. And indeed, uh, just last week, this 125-year uh, house, it's, it was a, it's a red brick Victorian um, where Emmett Till, last lived before he visited Mississippi and was murdered. And it was just declared last week as a historic landmark by the Chicago City Council. I believe it's owned by a nonprofit called Blacks and Green. And it's um, going to be some sort of, turn into some sort of tribute or museum. Next slide, please. So this is another Chicago example that's not built yet. It's called the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial. It's also in the category of brand new monuments <laughs> being created, but two histories that have been erased or silenced. This is part of a really important unprecedented reparations legislation that was passed by the city of Chicago in 2015 for torture survivors of police brutality. And what's extraordinary is that the final component of the reparations legislation is the creation of a public memorial to the torture survivors. And this includes over 125 black and Latinx men, women and youth who were systematically tortured by former Chicago police commander, John Burge and the men under his command at the Chicago police headquarters, <coughs> excuse me, from 1972 to 1991. If you don't know about this case, it's really important. Please look it up. <laughs> um, so you can see the names and dates the artists have uh, engraved on the wall in their design. I think their design was called Breath, Form, and Freedom. Next slide, please. Um, the artist are Patricia Wen and architectural designer John Lee. They went through a, a community process, which I think is important to keep in mind, uh, that decided their design. And they call their design, which I think is sort of interesting, a monumental anti-monument. Um, it was very important that uh, the, uh, a lot of the community expressed that they wanted it to be participatory and something that you engaged with. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to end on this quote from the American Historical Association. It's an excerpt that's sort of dispelling this idea <laughs> that taking down monuments is the removal of history. This was a statement that they put out after the events in, in Charlottesville in 2017, um, you know, particularly they say a monument is not history itself. A monument commemorates an aspect of history representing a moment in the past when a public or private decision defined who would be honored in a community's public spaces. To remove such monuments is neither to change history nor erase it. What changes with such removals is what American communities decide is worthy of civic honor. So I, I leave it at this question, who do we want to honor and raise up? And then in some ways, more importantly, how do we want to do that? 
Um, you know, can we think beyond the bronze sculpture and the bronze plaque? Can they be tiny? Do they have to be mon monumental? Can they be portable? Do they have to be permanent to do a legacy justice? Can they be funny? A lot of these monuments are very, very serious. How can they encourage more participation? How can they be more inclusive or more just? How can they subvert normative ideas around nationhood, patriarchy, gender, empire, community? Uh, next slide. So I know we're gonna have a lot more discussion and I'm looking forward to presentations. And this is how you can contact me if you wanna reach out. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for that presentation. That was wonderful. And I certainly saw the news of Emmett Till uh, recently, and I think a lot of people were pleased to hear that. So thank you for that presentation. It was absolutely phenomenal. Next, we will move into another presentation from Dr. Tiffany Fryer. So if you could just pop up on the screen here so everybody could see your lovely face, that would be great. Hi, Tiffany. So Dr. Tiffany Fryer, she is a Coatsen Postdoctoral Fellow in the Society of Fellows at Princeton, where she is also a lecturer in anthropology and the Humanities Council. She earned her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania after completing a dissertation based on long-term field work from, the, from uh, the University of Pennsylvania after completing that dissertation uh, with a collaborative heritage initiative in southeastern Mexico known as the Tiasuco Heritage Preservation and Community Development Project. Her research investigates settler colonialism as a form of political violence and focuses especially on how such violence, the things and places it generates, and the memories that result from its experience yield collective notions of heritage and socio-political consciousness across time. She is currently writing a book based on this research and we certainly look forward to reading that book at some point soon, but for right now, we will anxiously uh, await your presentation for this panel. Thanks. Um, pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. Just want to say thanks again to Diane Wallman and John Sims and their team for all the work we're having. Uh, me, uh, we're having a little bit of some connection issues. Uh, you're sounding a little bit choppy, so maybe we should try this again. I would hate to have you to continue on and uh, everyone not be able to understand. No. So we'll give it a second here to see if we can resolve this. Um, I'm not sure maybe if they're, the headphones are an issue maybe or causing some sort of interference. You can try that. No. So I think what we should do is maybe we should go to the next presenter and then come back to you, if that's okay? Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So next up on our agenda, we have Dr. Uzi Baram. Now, we're really excited for his presentation as well. He was born in Haifa, Israel, and raised on Long Island, New York. The anthropologist uh, received advanced degrees from the State University of New York at Binghamton and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. On the faculty at New College since 1997, he offers a wide range of courses in archaeology and cultural anthropology. The founding director of the New College Public Archaeology Lab, Professor Baram has experimented with radical openness for public archaeology and has collaborated on several community-based heritage efforts around Sarasota and Manatee counties on the Florida Gulf Coast. We welcome you, Dr. Baram, and we look forward to this presentation. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, thank you, 
to Diane Warman and to John Sims uh, for this series. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm gonna start with the personal. Uh, my parents brought me to the United States uh, when I was a young child. And they really liked going around to museums and historic places really all around the Northeast, wherever they could drive from Long Island. And in those days before the internet long ago, uh, they would choose a place we would go. And for the most part, I would read the signs to understand what was going on at the place and why it was important. And I say that because signs were important to me and they still are important as ways to understand what's there. My theme for this presentation is the roads taken for commemoration. And it plays off the place of this park we're focusing on, uh, 301, a major route through Ellington, close to the Tamiami Trail and I-75. It's a park with a visitor center, two historic buildings, uh, readily visible from a very busy street. Uh, there's lots of ways to get to the Gamble Plantation, uh, but there's also a major roadblock. Part of what you'll be seeing in this presentation is my approach to research. I have decided long ago to focus on the local and I'm going to be thinking a bit out loud with you all about the place of this park in the region. As the introduction said, my approach is radical openness. It's a concept I borrowed from Bell Hooks, who used it to explain the insights that come from the margin, and I use it for the process of critical approaches to the public past. I want to frame my engagement with the Judah P. Benjamin Confederate Monument to the Gamble Plantation Historic State Historic Park in terms of anthropology and my public archaeology programs across Sarasota and Mandy counties here on the Florida Gulf Coast. My efforts have been wide ranging. Projects from Lil Salt Spring to the Manti Mineral Spring, from Old Mayaka uh, to the coastline, from the deepest past in this region and really North America, through the more recent past to the early 19th century freedom seekers who lived by the Manatee River and 20th century transportation networks. I teach at New College of Florida, which is a small liberal arts college. And one of the decisions I made when I opened the New College Public Archaeology Lab was to expose all the elements of the archaeological process, everything from the planning process to the excavations, to the lab work, to exhibits, to students and to the interested community members. And by doing so, by thinking about all the different components that go into what we think of as archaeology, I realized more and more how really well dissatisfied I was just about the excavations and the scholarly reports. Of course, did those and always made sure they were done. But what was going to be left of those efforts? What would be left beyond the academic reports and the student and community experiences? More and more, I think about archaeology in terms of the future. And I think really hard, particularly living on the Florida Gulf Coast with its rising sea levels and threats of climate change, of what's commemorated, what's preserved, and what future generations are going to think of us and our decisions. I see the Judah P. Benjamin Confederate Memorial at Gamble Plantation Historic State Park as a really interesting question for this region and for this state. And so it really is a question of heritage and historic preservation. I started approaching the issues as an academic through history, through anthropology, archaeology, thinking about sociological issues, but more and more have felt myself most at home with heritage studies to examine the relationship between people and places, peoples in the past through social science approaches. And I understand those issues from heritage and historic preservation as a recursive relationship between the materiality of the landscape on the landscape and popular support for preservation tempered by the inequalities of power and politics. I started learning this lesson back in 1998, the year after I arrived at New College in Sarasota. And I saw community interest in preserving a 1920s Neo-Mediterranean building right in the center of Sarasota. There's a nice image of it. There was so much support for this building that even elementary school kids donated funds. But the developer tore it down, it was bulldozed, it's gone. 
popular interest is important, but knowing where power lurks, even more so. There's one approach to dealing with Confederate monuments. Uh, what you see pictured here is the Confederate monument for Judah P. Benjamin in Sarasota. It was placed in 1942. Here's my son about 10 years ago, one of my kids at the simple display with a sundial, two benches and the historic marker. The story that was told was that in 1942, members of the United Daughters of the Confederacy raised it to commemorate Judah P. Benjamin and to show that the Confederacy was opposed to anti-Semitism, just as Hitlerism was threatening the United States. Uh, I can assure you that few knew or cared about this commemoration. It sits in front of a, a bocce set, uh, uh, Sarasota Lawn Association bowling. And then with the uprisings of this summer, Sarasota had it removed in June, 2020. And frankly, that view looks nicer without it. As I think about those kind of issues and those kind of responses, I also think about our public parks because part of looking at the Gamble Plantation is realizing it's part of the public park system. And I think about this park and so many others and what could get it to become more inclusive. I'm an anthropologist. And so I start with cultural relativism. And I looked at the historic details for the memorial and its component, and three in particular that dominate the commemoration, Judah P. Benjamin, Robert Gamble, and the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Uh, Judah P. Benjamin's a fascinating character. Uh, his parents were Sephardic Jews who came from London, moved to the Caribbean, and then to Charleston, South Carolina, which some might know was the major Jewish center in the United States until the late 19th century. He was born in 1811 there. He entered Yale at an incredibly young age, moved to New Orleans and became part of the bar, married a wealthy socialite, became a successful sugarcane planter, was elected to United States Senate, was known as a brilliant orator. And when Louisiana joined the Confederacy, Benjamin left the Senate and Jefferson David Davis appointed him in turn, the Attorney General, the Secretary of War, and the Secretary of State for the Confederacy. Uh, there are those who refer to him as the brains of the Confederacy. After the destruction, the defeat, Benjamin fled along with Jefferson Davis. He has a nice map uh, showing the last parts of it. He got down to the Gamble Plantation, in Ellington, where he spent a few nights and then down to uh, Yellow Bluffs, what's now Sarasota. That's where, why there was that small marker in Sarasota. He was able to escape and made to England, became famous as a lawyer there, published a famous book on personal property and ultimately died uh, in Paris in 1884. The other part is the Gamble Plantation itself named after Robert Gamble, who was born in 1813 in Virginia. Uh, the photo you see, the, picture, the image you see of him comes from his uh, service fighting the Seminoles during the Second Seminole War. He came down to uh, the Manatee River, part of the Armed Occupation Act that granted 160 acres for those who developed the land, armed it, and kept away the Seminoles. Uh, he was known as a bachelor living in a lavished home. He sold the property in 1856 to his brother-in-law, and then ultimately the land went in 1858. Uh, the property itself changed hands several times, including to 1872, to the Patents, whose house still stands there. And the United Daughters of the Confederacy purchased the land in 1925 and donated it in 1927. Uh, I'll make two quick comments, one I should have made after Benjamin. Uh, there's really nothing to generate American pride about Judah P. Benjamin on any level. Uh, neither his service to the Confederacy, nor his escape, nor his uh, service to the Queen. And when we look at Gamble, Robert Gamble, and then those who followed him, they failed. And their plantation is really nothing to emulate there as well. But we do have an interesting place. And this place of enslavement is a place that can raise consciousness over the people who worked the land 
who made the tabby that is the material for the whitewashed building and the canals that cross-cut the area. The major crop was sugarcane that was grown and processed there. And there is so much that is important in looking around this park and particularly its beautiful uh, neoclassical building. Those United Daughters of the Confederacy did give it uh, to uh, the state. And that also is part of this history and the commemoration, right? We have this recursive aspect in heritage studies, but we don't just look at what happened, but also how things are preserved, how they're commemorated. And this is part of what we need to think about on multiple levels when we ask, what do we commemorate today? Uh, I'll step back and use uh, my larger archeological uh, viewpoint uh, that states very simply that things last and tyrants do not. That we can see the things that were built under tyrannical rule, uh, sometimes great monuments, large scale buildings. Uh, this of course is one of the more famous from tyrannic Egypt, uh, but we don't need to honor them as they wished to be honored. These monuments are sites of struggle. And when I think about the current park, and I'm gonna be harsh, hopefully uh, that encourage some discussion, uh, I think it fails. It should be a popular place. It's located in a populated area near lots of roadways. It's beautiful in terms of its spaces and the building itself is quite striking. The marking, right, again, that uh, child would look at, uh, when I was a child, would look at the signs. It's about someone who doesn't make sense for the place beyond his couple of nights he spent there. And it kind of goes against what a state park should be, which is for all the citizens. Uh, one answer, of course, Sarasota had, which was to remove, uh, but I don't think that's what we're looking for at this place at all. And so I reach into some of the other projects I've done in the region. One is from a different time period and a very different type of family and uh, labor relations, uh, but a similar sort of landscape. At Philippia State Park, which is owned by Sarasota County, the main part of the landscape, what's most striking, what's most visible, is the Edson Keith Estates built in 1916. In the pre-pandemic days, the county encouraged and people had weddings and other events there. It's often photographed. It's a nice part of this landscape, but Philippia State Parks manager and Sarasota County Parks don't just focus on this part of the story. Uh, I was asked several years ago to lead excavations. I of course wrote up a report, but thanks to the partnership with Sarasota County, we worked with the public. We made sure that people knew what was going on at this park in terms of all its histories. And so what we laid out during the centennial for that house was not just a story about Edison Keith and his wife, Nettie, or and their children, and not just the servants who were there, but all the histories from the archaic period people from 6,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago for the Minnesota period people. And that's what you see in the image in the flyer in the later periods in the early 1800s. There are Cuban fishing ranchos to give the name to the creek that becomes the name of the park, Philippi, to the Seminoles. We tried to tell of archeology span and I can say uh, really without false modesty, it's been really successful in bringing more people to the park and understanding those histories, understanding why this is important for everyone in Sarasota County. Doing similar work, although not quite the same level, but important for kind of thinking about issues of the Confederacy, worked at one of the cemeteries in Sarasota, the Galley Cemetery uh, in the days of segregation, the black, one of the black cemeteries of Sarasota. Many of the people who are buried there have connections to the mid to 19th centuries. And by trying to raise the profile of the cemetery, including the cleanup of it, to make sure people know of those achievements, the abilities to overcome the struggles and the challenges to lead successful lives that led to a really successful neighborhood in Sarasota, the Newtown community. Others have joined in this sort of marking of the cultural landscape to remember 
those who struggled and succeeded. Uh, what you see on the left is from Lido Beach in Sarasota, which in 1955 was desegregated thanks to the courage of the young people of Newtown of Sarasota. And the previous speaker mentioned uh, the Remembrance Project, and that's coming to Sarasota Manatee as well, that Equal Justice Initiative to remember the harsh truths of the lynching era and those who were able to survive it and were able to keep their families intact and give us the present that we have today. Just on the other side of the Manatee River, I worked on a project known as Looking for Angola by the Manatee Mineral Spring. And the uh, Angola project, Angola was a maroon community starting in the 1770s that lasted until 1821, uh, destroyed 20 years before Gamble came with the Armed Occupancy Act to claim land. And what we did there is similar to what you heard uh, for Philippia State Park. We made sure that this refuge of peace, this haven of freedom was better known. This maroon community is now a major focus of attention in the region. And as we worked through it, we made sure all the histories from the Native American through the Spanish, through Angola, through the Anglo-American settlers to the present was known. And as I start wrapping up this presentation, I'll mention one of the signs that focused on the Civil War and mentions the 2nd Infantry Regiment, the colored troops who came during the Civil War, uh, camped by the Manatee Mineral Springs and were part of the destruction of the sugar mills at Gamble Plantation, what I would actually take to be the liberation of that land from what had been uh, Confederate uh, holdouts. Uh, this approach with Angola on one side of the river and uh, Monument on the other is meant to bring together the two parts of the Manatee River, to bring forward the indigenous history for what's known locally as the Singing River, to recognize Angola, whose name comes from not by the Manatee Mineral Springs where I excavated, but from the north side of what was then known as the Oyster River, for the Anglo-American pioneers and their enslaved people, for the second regiment that liberated that location, for what occurred after the Civil War with reconstruction and then the lynching era, an inclusive history that hopefully would encourage more diverse visitations and more visitations for all the peoples of the state for which this park represents. That's my vision and I thank you all for listening to it. Thank you. Got to unmute myself there. Thank you so much, Dr. Baram, for such a fantastic presentation. And at this time, I think we will try to bring back Dr. Fryer if we can uh, hopefully have those audio issues resolved. Hi, is this any better? That is much better. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. We will let you move forward with your presentation. Okay, great. So I'm not sure what the problem was, but I'm glad we're good to go. So hi again, everyone. Um, I'm Tiffany Fryer, and I, um, I'm going to keep my comments relatively brief this evening because I'm really excited to be a part of such a great group of folks on this panel, and I hope we can you know, have a really uh, fruitful conversation. Um, but I thought I would start by um, offering a few reflections with respect to what I'm thinking about academically and intellectually, since that was sort of the theme for tonight's panel um, in particular, uh, and then share a couple of images with you all just to sort of ground you in what it is that I do. So as a Black archaeologist working with um, an Indigenous Maya community in southeastern Mexico primarily, um, I want to underscore that I think one of my intellectual aims has been to sort of infiltrate anthropology and archaeology and heritage studies with the very generative and often difficult conversations that um, continue to emerge from thinking at the intersection of indigenous, black, and hemispheric American studies, broadly speaking. And I think this is especially true with respect to issues of commemoration um, and reckoning with the very violent histories of settler colonialism and racial capitalism, both in this country, but also across the Americas. And I understand this thinking together as a sort of critical form of recovery that informs both my research and my teaching. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of images that I thought might help 
introduce some of that research and teaching um, now. And since this talk is geared toward thinking about the academic communities and how we might take action, I also wanna focus on something I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is the importance of landscape perspectives or assemblage perspectives writ large. And what I mean by that is sort of, while we can focus on specific monuments, which uh, we obviously have seen a whole lot of this year in particular, um, we also have to think about how their nodes in these larger operating assemblages of available heritage practices um, that fluctuate and sediment depending on the strength and perspectives of the other materials and practices that are simultaneously at play. So, you know, I think it's really important to um, consider the work that specific particular monuments do, but to also understand that they are, um, they are participating in a larger um, uh, cultural and social and political conversation. So let me just pull these images up. Okay. Um, so my work, um, recently anyways, I've um, been involved with a few different projects, but the primary work that I've been doing has been um, in deep collaboration with a community in central, or excuse me, in southeastern um, Mexico on the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, in the state of Quintana Roo in particular, which is uh, quite well known at the, the international level for its beautiful and expansive um, tourism industry there. So you have Cancun, Tulum, Playa del Carmen for anyone who's not familiar with the region. Uh, and I'm working about two hours inland from there in a town called Teosuco. Now, Teosuco is um, probably most famous for its association with the caste war of Yucatan. It's considered the cradle of this war, which um, has been described as sort of an anti-colonial agrarian, predominantly Maya uprising of the late 19th century. Uh, and it lasts for about 54 years and completely reorganizes the political landscape of the Yucatan. Uh, and this project that I'm involved in grew out of a collaboration between the Penn Cultural Heritage Center at the University of Pennsylvania, which is directed by uh, Dr. Richard Leventhal there and uh, various members of the Teosuco community. And this project has taken sort of what we've come to think of as a very umbrella heritage approach. So there, um, there are some more conventional practices like community archeology span that's happening, um, but the community also has a, uh, a local museum that's dedicated to commemorating this particular conflict. So working on museum development, uh, but also expanding beyond that, right? We're doing things like oral histories work, um, historic preservation advocacy. Um, we're working on language revitalization uh, with, the, with the youth in town, right? So there's a lot of different sort of aspects that are going into this. Um, but with respect to this particular talk, what I thought I might show you is some of the ways that uh, the monumental enter this landscape. So this particular image right here is actually not located in or near Teosuco, um, immediately near anyways. This is located in Merida, which is the capital of the state of Yucatan. It's about two and a half hours northwest of uh, where, I, where I work. And this monument is to the lost heroes of, of the caste war. Um, and it was built by the Yucatecan army um, and commissioned by the Yucatecan government at, in 1883, which is about halfway through conventional um, uh, periodization of this war. So the war breaks out in 1847 and it's generally considered to have ended by 1901. And so this is about midway through the war and it's in a very, very busy plaza um, the plaza is named for one of the Yucatecan generals, um, Eulogio Rosado, who um, became very famous for his campaigns against indigenous insurrectionists to the south. Um, and this particular monument takes a very specific understanding of heroes that I think um, in some ways mimics uh, the, the kind of 
um, hero veneration that we see emerging uh, in the Confederacy, right? So you have this very specific image. One of the things that I think is really fascinating about it as well is despite the fact that it's in Mexico, it takes a very um, period motif, which is to have um, the goddess Athena, the Greek goddess Athena on top of it, marking, um, marking this war and, and the valor of, of the so-called lost heroes who would have referred specifically to Yucatecan soldiers who fell during the war. Now, if you go farther south to where I work in uh, Southern Quintana Roo, um, you have a very different perspective on what heroes means. So um, these monuments, you see one on the left to Cecilio Chi, which is in, in the township just north of where I work, and Jacinto Pat, who is the patron leader of Piosuco. These monuments were both uh, erected in the late 1900s, in the early 1990s, late 20th century. Um, and they are to also to the heroes of the cast war. Um, but in this context and at this historical moment, what that meant was the, the uh, originary leaders of this particular conflict. So you have two um, Maya, indigenous Maya leaders here who are being depicted and, um, and occupying space at the center of the towns uh, that they were from and at the center of where this war was. So you have two very different understandings of what uh, it means to have been a hero of this particular conflict operating in these spaces. But to get back to what I was saying about uh, the importance of thinking about these monuments uh, in conversation with the larger memorial assemblage, as it were, um, I wanted to also point out some of the other uh, nodes of, uh, of commemoration and remembrance that, that uh, circulate in Teosuko. So these are um, two structures. So on the left, you have uh, a colonial building known as a quinta that is at the center of Teosuko. Uh, it's one of many, uh, which were symbolic of the power of Spanish Creole settlers during the 19th century. And Teosuco was understood as sort of one of the, the farthest Creole settlements um, from the economic center at, at Merida, where the first monument that I showed you was. So this, this was a really important building practice that had a lot of implications for how power was, uh, was represented in the landscape. Today, one of those buildings, the one that you're seeing here, has been converted into this museum, the Museo de la Guerra de Casas, that is dedicated to, um, to the history of the caste war. And it's got a, a really complicated dynamic at play there because it is a state-funded um, museum that, uh, you know, the funding comes from the state. This is considered an anti-colonial, anti-Yucatecan insurrection. Um, but of course, now the state government is finding ways to um, support and uh, uh, present this history in new ways. And one of the ways that they have done that is by founding this museum and then allowing its operation um, by people from Teosuco and the surrounding region whose uh, ancestors were active, um, were active insurrectionists. Um, the image on the right is the central church in Teosuco. So most Spanish towns were built around large plazas and large churches. And this church is the most iconic image to come from the town that I, I work in. Um, it was bombed in 1867 uh, by insurrectionist forces. And it now stands as perhaps the biggest memorial to the war um, in the town, despite other more manufactured and uh, deliberate forms of commemoration that are at play there. So you have sort of those material, those material uh, representations uh, and forms of, of heritage and commemoration, but you also have the performative and the active and the, the more 
um, you know, what some scholars have called intangible um, uh, at play. And one good example of that is the anniversary festival that is held in Teosuko every summer from um, July 26th to the 31st, which commemorates the um, beginning of the caste war, which happened just north of Teosuko in the town of Tepeach. Uh, and then um, Teosuko became sort of the cradle after that. So all of the surrounding towns gather in Teosuko and there are a number of performative uh, commemorative uh, acts that happen during this time. Over the years, it has become co-opted a little bit more every year um, by local state and municipal politicians. And so there's actually been a sort of emergent divide between um, those in town who really value this festival from a personal heritage sort of perspective and those who um, might seek to use it to advance particular political agendas. Um, and at the same time during, during that um, festival, but also throughout the year, there are a number of other kinds of commemoration that happen in town, including smaller scale um, exhibitions, uh, ongoing collaborative research programs, uh, archeological research in particular, that's looking at the swath of, of um, places that were destroyed and um, temporarily abandoned due to the war. Um, and then uh, youth, the youth programming with the museum in particular. Um, but it's also important to note that just like, uh, you know, so you have, this, you have this war landscape, this war commemorative landscape, but there are other forms of commemoration that are happening in that same space um, and other forms of monumental practice. And so um, this image is a picture from 2017 of a statue that was erected in Teosuko, um, oddly uh, erected. People had very mixed feelings about it because it's, it, it depicts an ancient Maya ball player, um, which, is a, which is sort of a common representational theme across Yucatan that is um, meant to, to cite ancestral Maya practices. Um, but many people in Teosuko felt that it was misplaced. Uh, the question is, why is this here? This isn't our direct history. This isn't the thing that we um, constantly sort of uh, center our identities on. Why is this here? And, and this was um, sponsored by a local politician who was trying to gain favor. And so I think thinking also about not just how these um, monumental practices speak to one another, but also how they emerge in the first place and what that means in terms of the kinds of conversations and dialogues that um, will emerge from them and historical narratives that will emerge from them is important. So I'm gonna transition just a little to talk about um, some of the other research and, and teaching. I was really um, pleased this past summer to have been able to moderate um, this great panel on, on monuments and memory, but I, I wanna mention it here because um, one of the things that it did that I thought was really important was to start to talk about everything that we were witnessing um, in that very immersive moment uh, of late spring, early summer 2020, um, in a way that really centered this assemblages notion that I'm talking about here, this landscape notion. How are all of these things working uh, together? And, um, and it did so by bringing together um, anthropologists, archaeologists, curators, and contemporary artists in much the way that this particular series is doing. And so I think uh, that kind of work has been the most generative, right? Thinking about how all of these things are operating in tandem. When I started um, teaching at Princeton, one of the courses that I taught, and I actually taught this last um, last spring, right right before the sort of tumult of the of the summer, and obviously as the pandemic was unrolling, um, was at Princeton. It was a course on on monuments and um, and memory and cultural heritage, and one of the things that we did was explore um, the kinds of work that was being done on Princeton's campus in order to reckon with, um, with the place of Woodrow Wilson on, on that campus. Um, and that's been fraught, but one of the things I think it highlights this point about assemblage and 
landscape uh, is the fact that it, it forced people to think about not only how do we reckon with this, but what does it mean to start to change what our landscape actually looks like. And so this is where we thought, as we've seen at many universities over, over the last year, but certainly the past few years, um, a reevaluation of um, things as simple as building names, right? And so even, even the ways that we name our landscape um, plays into this commemorative uh, assemblage. Um, um, I'm so excited that uh, that so far Jennifer and Uzi have also turned to the work that the Equal Justice Initiative has been doing. So this is what I'm going to close on my comments on. I um, I have been thinking alongside EJI's work for several years now, and um, what I wanted to do was think about not just what it you know what the memorial means. Um, it's a profound memorial. If if you have not and ever have the chance, please do see it. It is a profound memorial. But it emerged through an understanding that, that larger societal problems were um, centered on these bigger assemblages of how we commemorate and how we um, narrativize our histories and how we choose to not do so under some circumstances. Um, and, and I think what they have been able to do, to do by targeting multiple aspects of the heritage landscape through museology, through memorial crafting, through marker dedications, um, through community-based remembrance projects, um, that's, that has been such thorough and important work, right? They're targeting multiple landscapes. Um, but none of it, none of it is being done just to be done. It's all motivated by the larger problems that the Equal Justice Initiative has been um, has been dealing with uh, for decades now with respect to um, the injustices uh, of the criminal justice system in our country. And so I think it's also important to be thinking about what is it that is actually motivating our, um, our commemorative and uh, memorial work and why do we study those things? So that's where I'll stop for now. And I look forward to um, getting to, to converse with you all a little bit more before we end tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Fryer. That was a wonderful presentation. And last but certainly not least, we will have Dr. Diane Wallman, who we will bring up right now, who has been so wonderful in helping all of this come together. So Dr. Diane Wallman is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida and director of the USF Historical Archaeology Laboratory. She has a PhD from the University of South Carolina, a master's from Washington State University, and a bachelor's from Skidmore College. Dr. Wallman is a historical archeologist focusing on the history of European colonialism and Atlantic slavery. She is co-editor of the book, Archeology span in Dominica, Everyday Ecologies and Economies at Morn Patat out of the University Press of Florida. Dr. Wallman is a National Geographic Explorer for an archeological project on the Caribbean island of Dominica. And she has received multiple grants and awards for her archeology span and community-based research with publications across diverse venues. And with that, we welcome you, Dr. Dr. Diane Wallman, and we look forward to this presentation. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can get the screen shared here. There we go. Um, thank you so much, Emerald. And I just want to thank my uh, colleagues on the panel here tonight. Um, you've already made me think about a lot of things and, um, you know, kind of influence the discourse going forward with these topics. Um, tonight, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about my, my local research here in Florida. Um, and Dr. Brown has already fortunately introduced us to kind of this, this site in general. Um, but what I want to focus on a little bit as an archaeologist is this idea of recovery. Um, so as an archaeologist and a historian, you know, I'm looking to kind of excavate the past, um, both in the material sense and in the sense that, you know, I want to understand the processes that have led to um, the current situation we're in, you know, um, including the contemporary issues that have been discussed tonight, you know, the past year and beyond. 
that have caused kind of this national, these national movements. Um, and I, I conceive of archeology span um, as doing many things, um, of course, reconstructing the past, but also I see archeology span as an opportunity to create political action. So what we can do as archeologists span is to help dismantle historical narratives produced from white supremacy and racism. Um, I, I see myself as an accomplice to um, cite my, my colleagues in the field of archeology span to contribute to anti-racist scholarship and to challenge the people narratives and ideologies, um, these silent and complicit, who are silent and complicit in anti-blackness. So I've done this most recently through my research at the Judah P. Benjamin Confederate Memorial at Gamble Plantation Historic State Park. Um, so this is where I focus on my, my current efforts. And what I've been doing there is really thinking about um, these issues of right commemoration, as everybody has been talking about tonight in the various contexts. So we're moving back a little bit to the US um, from Mexico to Florida um, and thinking about these spaces, spaces here. So who are we honoring, right? Well, who's, what is said and not said? Whose histories are remembered or erased or silenced? Um, what does a differential treatment of these histories tell us about modern contemporary power relations and inequality? Right, so for me, as I started working at Gamble Plantation, it was, okay, it's this Confederate monument or a Confederate memorial, the whole plantation is dedicated to this uh, individual. Um, I became interested in representations at these sites, um, memorials and monuments and how symbols, languages and names are created and commemorated. And I think by understanding the processes of history and how these narratives are constructed, um, and how these narratives are naturalized, such as the, the narratives of white supremacy um, and anti-blackness, um, we can begin to dismantle those, help to, be, help to dismantle those structures in the present. Um, so what are we commemorated? What are we commemorating? What do monuments do? How are they created? I'm gonna start out tonight with um, one of the foremost scholars on reconstruction who wrote the following in 1935. And I think all of these quotes I'm gonna read to you speak true today. So if those who really, well, so there's W.E. Du Bois, sorry, in Black Reconstruction in America in the chapter, The Propaganda of History. If those who really had the opportunity to know the South before the war wrote the truth, it was a center of widespread ignorance, undeveloped resources, suppressed humanity and unrestrained passions, with whatever veneer of manners and cultures that could lie above these depths. He also said, of all historic facts, there can be none clearer than that of the four long and four fearful years the South fought to perpetuate human slavery. Yet one monument in North Carolina achieves the impossible by recording of Confederate soldiers, they died fighting for liberty. And then finally, he wrote, the chief witness in reconstruction, the emancipated slave himself has been barred, almost barred from court. His written reconstruction record has been largely destroyed and nearly always neglected. And again, I think these words ring true today um, from the, the ever um, you know, powerful words of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, so just to give you a little background on Florida in general, as I said at the beginning, Florida was a Confederate state. Um, you know, the, by the 1860s, it was almost over 40% enslaved laborers in the population. Um, once Florida became a US state, they, they, the, and the plantocracy strove to create an old South on the frontier. So mirroring the Carolinas, Georgia and other Southern states. Um, and a lot of planters moved down from Virginia to establish plantation, mostly cotton and other plantations here in Florida. Um, in 1861, Florida seceded from the union. Um, Florida in their statement, and they were the third state to secede, did not actually uh, state slavery is a reason, but if you look at most of the other articles of, of session, you will note that most of the states named slavery as a reason for seceding from the union. Um, this is a really brief <laughs> history on reconstruction, but I think it's important. Um, so after the Civil War, we most of us know the history there. The primary consequences of reconstruction were emancipation, emancipation citizenship, citizenship and suffrage, at least for um, men. Um, in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments um, and restoring the South to the Union. Really, these efforts were soft and unsustained for various political reasons. Lincoln's assassination, one of them, and Andrew Johnson, a former, um, you know, a Southern Democrat, 
um, who took over. And so the former Confederates in all, most of the Southern states eventually worked their way into the state and uh, federal governments from these states in reconstruction. And so the responses in the South to this um, were, were sort of parallel in most states. And in particular in Florida, you see a, the foundation of various organizations to contest uh, reconstruction and the potential uh, consequences of the Civil War. So to maintain white supremacy. So they founded these, these legions to oppose black supremacy. Um, they actually conducted guerrilla warfare. Um, you know, in 1868 alone, Democrats killed over 20 Republicans. And we have to think about the context of those words at the time. Um, and in total, during Reconstruction in Florida, about 150 lives of white Republicans and African Americans were taken. By the end of Reconstruction, the um, Democrats had eliminated all political threats. So the, the, slave, the plantocracy ma were, was maintained and this planter class controlled the state's governmental apparatus. Um, and so this is where the time period where we begin to see the origins of what is called the lost cause of the Confederacy in response to the fear of, you know, citizenship, suffrage, civil rights, equality for, for African Americans in our country, fear of what the Union government would do, and fear of migrating Northerners to the South, carpet, carpetbaggers. Um, so Edward Pollard's Lost Cause was one of the more popular books at the time. There are many um, scholars and folks who wrote on this, um, but he wrote this book, The Lost Cause. It became really popular among white Southerners. Um, and he wrote that, or he, he was trying to suggest that the system of black servitude in the South was not slavery. He said that the, the Civil War was brought on by Northern insurgents against the authority of the Constitution. It was not a Southern rebellion. You know, this is where you get the war between the states. One quotation I have from him in his book um, that kind of indicates his position, but we may suggest a doubt here, whether that odious term slavery, which has been so long imposed by the exaggeration of Northern writers upon the judgment and sympathies of the world is properly applied to that system of servitude in the South, which really in the, was really the mildest in the world, which should not rest on acts of debasement and disenfranchisement, but elevated the African and was in the interest of human improvement and which made them altogether the most striking, striking type in the world of cheerful, cheerfulness and contentment. Um, and so, you know, you can see these same kind of ideas perpetuated today, right? Um, we saw the Confederate flag not a few weeks ago in the Capitol building, right? Supporting this cause, these ideas, these revisionist histories. Um, Gaines Foster defines the movement as post-war writings and activities that perpetuated the memory of the Confederacy. Again, Southerners were trying to come to terms with the failure of the war. So during this time, uh, local organizations developed um, with the goal of memorializing local Confederate soldiers. Um, many monuments were donated in particular by the Ladies Memorial Association, which became the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And because Reconstruction was very soft and you know, didn't have many consequences on the plantocracy in the South, they were very powerful politically and were able to use that power to vindicate the lost cause, construct these monuments at the time, and you know, really celebrate and honor this ideology that they had created. And so we see in the 1900s an expansion of the monuments. Um, most of the UDC monuments in Florida were constructed actually in the 1920s. Um, and this is common throughout the South, South, and this was supporting the political kind of strife and the racial strife that was occurring when states were trying to pass Jim Crow segregation, voting registration, and so on. So at Gamble Plantation, which Uzi, uh, Dr. Brom gave you a nice introduction to, um, they say the site is designated to uh, Judah P. Benjamin because of its connection with the dramatic events at the close of the war between the states. Moreover, it is a memorial of a way of life slept, swept away by war. So you're seeing this romantic version of um, the antebellum South. And also, as, as Dr. Brown talked about, the, these accounts of the Judah P. Benjamin escape um, have various lost cause tropes, including the kind of loyal slave account um, and various parts of the account. There's a lot of discrepancies in there. Um, so you see all of this in there. Of course, the UDC, as Dr. Brown said, donates this, the, the Gamble Mansion and surrounding land to the state. 
And they said that shall own the, the department, Florida Department of Natural Resources, now state parks, shall own the building and solely be responsible for the maintenance, protection, and management as a Confederate shrine and museum. So the plantation, the entire plantation that was basically built by the enslaved people is a Florida State Park and is a Confederate shrine. Um, and the UDC basically has control over what's displayed in the interpretation. There have been Confederate veteran reunions or reenactments, and you can see these lost cause ideas in the interpretation of the plantation. Despite the fact that 190 enslaved laborers in 1860 were living on the plantation, 40% of those were under 15 years old were children. Um, and so this is where I come in and did archeology, span archeological research, which I'm not actually gonna talk too much about. I'm just gonna show a few, few things here really quickly because I know we're all a little over time. Um, but at Gamble Plantation, I see archeology span as a medium to challenge this historical narrative to become more inclusive um, to, to, I mean, this is, again, it's a moral, it's a monument, this place that was constructed by and, and the hammocks were cleared by enslaved laborers and it's to a Confederate officer. So I banned research there in 2017. I'm just going to show a few pictures. We had local field schools, um, interpretive tours. It was completely open to the public. We had public come on public archaeology days. Um, and we focused on those days on these few things. So one, the fact that the, the enslaved laborers basically you know, cleared the entire plantation, um, 1,600 acres of the 3,500 that were owned by Gamble. Um, they excavated 16 miles of canals on that plantation, which you can see to this day in the DTM models. This is LIDAR, um, an a remote sensing technique used by archaeologists to identify features. They, they built, they constructed this, this beautiful mansion on the site using brick and tabby. Um, enslaved domestic enslaved laborers worked in the mansion cooking and cleaning for the gambles and the other or the gambles and the other owners and overseers of the plantations, likely living in the back of the house, which is currently designated as a work room. Excavations as the sugar mill are, are we're, we're conducting to better understand the organization of sugar production and the labor and experience of the enslaved. Um, so we're doing all of this again, as I said, to sort of help. Uh, challenge the narratives that have been present at this place for over a hundred years. Um, and, and we see too on the current UDC website as of 2017, in response to monument removal, they say, we are saddened that some people find anything connected with the Confederacy to be offensive. Our Confederate ancestors were and are Americans. We as an organization do not sit in judgment of them, nor do we impose the standards of the 21st century on these Americans of the 19th century. Um, and I, I would argue as an archeologist and historian um, that as we all know, um, from the beginning of Atlantic slavery, there were abolitionists and folks out there writing against slavery. This, there is you know, no one perspective at the time. And, and the perspective that we need to consider is that of the enslaved people who are living through this and the lives and the, the traditions and the experiences that that they went through. Um, so this is where I came, you know, I kind of came together with John Sims after I read his his articles and and we, you know, kind of conceived of this whole panel. Um, and John has done some wonderful work on kind of reimagining this plantation and I encourage you to to attend his keynote next week. Thank you. I'm sorry I went a bit over, but thank you everybody. This was just fantastic. You know, I'm just enamored as I've listened to all of the presenters here. And, you know, this has been a real treat again, as we are in Black History Month to sit through these presentations and listen to all of the phenomenal work that everybody has done and the ways in which you all have used your voices to, to tell stories and to include narratives that have been lost throughout history. So we have a couple of questions. And I am actually going to direct my first question to Dr. Scott. I kind of had a, a question or two for everybody. And um, Dr. Wallman, you can let me know how we are on time and, you know, just feel free to pop in. Um, but Dr. Scott, you're in the North, you know, a lot of the conversations surrounding um, monuments um, that 
have questions about them or anti-Black monuments. The conversations are happening a lot of times in the South. So my question to you is, do you feel in any way that the North gets away with erasing history, particularly African-American history, in a way that the South does not? Like there's so much focus on the Confederate monuments, but a lot of what you've talked about have been um, other leaders who have made great strides toward progress that have been forgotten by history or been forgotten by mainstream history. So I just wanted to throw that question out there to you. Thank you. And please call me Jennifer, everyone. Um, I, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if it's about getting away with it, although, you know, we can, we can argue about that. But I, my experience for example, with working in New York in Weeksville is uncovering, helping to continue to uncover a site a free black, of a free black community that was based in New York um, when a lot of people in New York didn't even know that people had been enslaved in New York <laughs> or that there were these huge Dutch farms and, and what's now uh, Kings County where people were enslaved like two thirds of every household. And so I, I think there's a lot of um, ignorance out there in terms of what people have learned through out their education, but even people who were experts or, or identified as experts in um, this particular history in New York history, they didn't know about this particular community. And I think that's where it helped to have, you know, we're all talking about archeology span to have the evidence. <laughs> Because what helped to bring out the story were the houses that were discovered and then mapped to that time through historic maps and you know um, as much archaeological evidence as at that they could find to prove that. So I think there is some willfulness, you know, that that match, <laughs> matches the South willfulness to ignore some history for sure. I I definitely think those cities can you know. Uh, aren't necessarily doing any better. But I think there's just a lot of opportunities that are missed because of priorities and what people think, uh, what people care about, what people choose to research in the archive. I mean, some of this information is there, but it's just not being paid attention to either. Some of it's, some of it is genuinely, genuinely not there. Um, but I, I think there, it's, these are all opportunities to kind of, now that you have the evidence, I mean, I'm thinking about Diane, your work, um, you know, you have you have this evidence that counters this narrative. And so now the question is, how do we recreate the interpretation? So I, I, I think, I mean, to answer your question about the North-South, I don't want to pit anybody. I don't want to start another war. <laughs> but I, I think that, I think there's opportunities all around and there's erasures that are systematic of the same problems of not facing, not caring, not prioritizing uh, Black history. Most definitely. It's something, like you said, we see all over. This next question can go out to anyone. And this question is, how do we decide what monuments and heritage sites are removed, recontextualized, or based on the individual or the event that's actually being memorialized? Like, for example, um, what if there are conflicting narratives, the founding fathers, with slave owners, et cetera, et cetera, or based on the intentions of their creators? And this can go out to anyone. No takers? <laughs> Everyone's shy. I guess I'll jump in and be the first. Uh, you know, my sense, uh, my commemorations should be about the present and what it wants for the future. And I don't really understand a notion that once something is up, it must be there forever. Uh, it's a particularly strange notion here in the west coast of Florida, uh, because so many structures are destroyed regularly. So many sites are destroyed just because of development, right, of place that had 100,000 people now has 21 million people. It's it just the just the number of people poured into this state uh, has changed the landscape dramatically. Yet somehow an obelisk is, is sacred. I, I do believe some places are sacred. I think you know houses of worship, cemeteries, uh, but 
of monuments and the one in, there was one in Bradenton uh, that when it was finally removed, uh, proved to be so cheaply made that even with the careful attempt to move it, it broke as they took it. It just showed the lie of it. It was not an important, it was put up as President Wallman points out in the 1920s for a racist purpose. It was done cheaply. It's a century later, we don't need to add meaning to it. It doesn't speak for how the present sees the future. I think that is a guiding light. Thank you. And actually, my next question is for you. Oh. <laughs> I, um, you know, the story of slavery in Florida, I feel, is one that has been undertold. And my question to you is, you know, speaking specifically about the Gamble Plantation, uh, how can Black voices be more included now in this space? And what resistance, if any, have you faced in your work in including these stories that have not been told? So I, I actually will add a little complication to it, that the story of enslavement hasn't really been told, but also the story of freedom hasn't really been told because Florida has been a haven for freedom since 1893, when the Spanish king proclaimed it was a haven for freedom for those who escaped from the Anglo colonies just to the north. So Fort Musée is a state park by St. Augustine. Prospect Bluff is a tremendously important place that's almost unknown. The work I did in Angola at the south side of the Manatee River, I, you know, the, I wish more people knew about. I, I just don't want to be the only one talking about it. Uh, and then there's the issue of enslavement as well, right? And W.B. Du Bois, uh, probably mentioned by President Wallman, wrote about the complexities in Florida during his dissertation. I mean, it, it's, as you've heard already, the information is there. We just have to raise it. Uh, what I've seen, though, and so I guess I'm not actually going to answer your question, is I've worked with community members. I've been really uh, blessed. Uh, the people have come to me and seen that I had, you know, some skill sets and asked me to contribute some of those. And many of them are African Americans. Sarasota has this dynamic uh, heritage uh, initiative with Newtown Alive that's brought out many of the issues uh, during the period of segregation and beyond. Uh, there are others working uh, across the region. Uh, and probably across the state as well. Uh, I think as an academic, maybe that's the way I can answer the question. Uh, I had to kind of break away from the assumptions of being at uh, college, that I didn't engage community members as the one who knew things, uh, but I went in what was a really good anthropological training is I started by listening. And I heard people who were so knowledgeable, so caring uh, and I saw the commonalities from my own background and what they were trying to do to remember that uh, process of emancipation, liberation. So I think, you know, the call might be uh, listen more carefully and uh, for my academic colleagues on this panel, right, that we need to really uh, rethink what the priorities are in academia, not just getting grants, not just publishing, not just uh, going to conferences, but also actually spending time with that community engagement, make it meaningful. And so I think there's a lot of positive possibilities and I think they're all kind of sprouting right now. Thank you so much. And for Dr. Fryer, I have a question for you. You have just done some phenomenal international work and your presentation shows just the range and depth of what you've been able to accomplish. So congratulations to you on the amazing work. Um, but my question to you is, is really about that international work and what lessons have you learned internationally that you could see playing out here? And what would you make as a suggestion for um, those on the panel today, like that you've learned internationally that we could apply here? That's a great question. I think, I think um, one of those things is that there's a lot more similarities than we might um, than we might normally assume, and I think part of that is due to the the shared history of colonialism and African slavery and all kinds of forms of racial capitalism that um, are really like very broadly spread across the Americas. Right? Uh, sometimes we get so absorbed in our own histories here in the United States that we fail to realize uh, how those things have operated quite similarly across um, national borders. 
uh, and continue to operate in that way, sometimes often uh, due to our own policies in, here in the United States, right? So I think, I think that's um, one thing to bear in mind. And I think the other thing to think about is um, the fact that, you know, when you're working internationally, each, for, for all of the similarities, each country operates differently, right? Um, but I, I wanna just highlight something um, Ozzy said, which is, which is that if we, if we pull back to these very fundamental practices of community-based work, uh, we can come through with, with very new perspectives and um, generative perspectives and perspectives that are towards a form of collective liberation in a way that um, more sort of top-down, um, uh, academically driven um, uh, projects have been able to do in the past, right? And it's not to say that that's not, that those don't produce valuable work as well, but there is something fundamentally different about the work that comes out of um, deep collaboration. And, and I think that that had to do with a set of sort of um, collective motivations for doing that work. And when that motivation is about collective liberation, about uh, justice, right, is about uh, anti-oppression, um, something really beautiful can emerge from that. And it doesn't, it's not bound by, by, by national you know, territory in that way. Thank you so much. And the next question can go out to anyone, but I'll also look at you, Dr. Wallman, since I haven't directed a question toward you, but um, for all of you all as academics and scholars, what ways in which do you see yourselves, your position, your research, uh, and your ability to, to reach different audiences? How do you uh, begin the process of rectifying what's been centuries of erasing these voices? And how do you make that connection? What tools do you use and, and how do you go about um, that very important work? Well, I'll just uh, really quickly, I think, you know, I think my colleagues have, have I'm gonna echo what they've said. I think they've, they've hit on the head with community you know, projects, not just community engagement, which is part of what we do, of course, but um, real you know, collective partnerships, collaboration with communities from the get-go on our research um, reach. And it, and, it, and it takes time, you know, as I've learned on this particular project I'm working on, you know, we've, we've finally reached out to some descendants and, and it's been wonderfully productive, um, you know, and, and shifted our perceptions of a lot of things in ways and it takes time. And I think one thing we have to think about is, is patience, right? Um, and this is an anthropological maybe perspective that all of us can speak to here on the panel um, that, that you need to, as, as Uzi was saying, and as others were saying, listen, you know, be patient, get, get, you know, involved in the community from a deep level, right? Not just kind of um, speaking out here and there, giving the panels we're giving here, but opening up to the communities and spending time within them, um, you know, such as Dr. Fry's work has shown in, in Mexico, so wonderfully um, productive. Um, and I also um, would say that as others have, have said and echoed here, um, that we need to reach beyond our, ourselves into you know, other realms like the art, the, the research so far, the collaborations I've had with artists even in the past few months have been so amazing, um, have, have opened my mind up um, into thinking about um, activism in different ways, thinking about, again, the responses that we can have to these um, public commemorations in different ways um, so reaching out beyond our own kind of academic bub bubbles um, into communities, but also into other, you know, areas of, of kind of creative thinking and scholarship. Um, and so things like this that we're do doing right now, you know, the panels that are, have been inspired by Black Lives Matter and all the movements that occurred within the last year, just reaching out to all of these different areas and working together. Um, you know, we work best when we kind of have a collective, as everybody has been saying, action, right? So um, that's how we move forward. And we need to, you know, what, one job is educating our students, of course, right? <laughs> and that's one thing we do, right? We teach in our classes and in our courses, we try to have students critically evaluate these, the past and the present and how these all, all these things connect. But um, yeah, it's also, I think, reaching beyond just the academy and reaching within the academy to other 
disciplines and areas to, to kind of make these collectives. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say, I know we are probably getting tight on time, but as a reporter, um, and I know this applies to you and, and piggybacks off of what you just said, community is so central to everything that I do. And it has been so incredibly important to me to make sure that I connect with communities and that, that I'm not just here to just go out, tell a story, leave the community, that I understand what's going on there. And in all of my years of life and from my upbringing and from my reporting experience, one thing that I have learned is that there is no American institution that has not been touched by race. Um, everything has been impacted in some way or another by race. So whatever area you are working in, whoever's on this panel, you can find a way to address some sort of racial injustice. If you look hard enough, it's there. I've learned that. I've learned everything. You know, you just can't escape it. And, you know, I, you have people sometimes who say, well, is everything about race? Kind of, <laughs> kind of, you know, and I, I say that in jest, but, I, and I say that meaning that our, our country is, is so deeply um, infiltrated with issues of race and um, it's, it's everywhere. And if you look, you don't really have to look very hard to find ways that you can um, make your work in, in some sort of way um, around this issue and impactful. So um, Diane, I will throw it back to you if you have any closing remarks or anything else, or I checked through the chats. I didn't see any other questions and I wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask the panelists anything that they'd like. But Diane, I, I will throw it to you if you have any, any final words you'd like to say. Yeah, I'd like to, to thank one of the people in the chat actually who put in a, la a last minute question here about um, accessibility to monuments. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something we also need to realize if we're thinking about you know inclusion, broadly speaking, right? We need to think about all levels of that. Um, and you know everything we're talking about here applies to you know every every other um, you know excluded group or or marginalized group that that that's out there. And so somebody spoke about monuments having more accessibility. And I think that's a, that is a really important and could, could take up a whole nother panel, right. On just in discussing those issues. So thank you to the, to the question there. Um, but yeah, I'd like, I guess we, I'd just like to thank everybody, you know, for coming. I'm going to put um, the, the chat, the registration for the next panel, which is John Sims keynote for this uh, series. Um, which should bring kind of together everything we've been talking about. So if you've been paying attention to all of them, you know, we've had, um, you know, various panels and everything from things from art um, and how art, the artist perception of, again, how to respond to these, these um, commemorative spaces and monuments um, to the kind of policy side of thing. And of course the academic today. And, and so, yeah, if you could register for that last event on Saturday at seven o'clock, it should be wonderful. I want to thank, um, Emerald for moderating this event. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate your questions and insight. Um, and yeah, just thank you all for attending. And thank you, Diane, for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. And thank you, John Sims as well. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, thank John you. Sims as well. Yeah. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. Everyone. Good night.